Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 320. We're talking about free community college today, and as usual, free is in quotation marks. We've all heard about the president's proposal, no doubt, for free community college for people whose grades entitle them to this new program. What are we to make of this idea? Well, joining me today is Professor Brian Kaplan, who teaches economics at George Mason University. His first book, The Myth of the Rational Voter, was chosen by the New York Times as the best political book of the year. His second book is Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids. And a third book is forthcoming. I'm not sure I'm supposed to spill the beans about it or not. We'll ask him about that in just a minute. Brian, welcome to the show. I'm very glad to be here. I thought of you right away when I heard about the community college proposal from the president, because I know you're working on yet another provocative book. You have a way with uh, in-your-face titles, like Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids is an in-your-face title. And likewise, is the book that you're working on still tentatively titled The Case Against Education? That's right, The Case Against Education. All right, so who better, right? Who better to talk to about this? I guess the idea behind this program is that if your grades, if your GPA, I guess, I think it's even just above a 2.5, which is not a particularly Mm -hmm. high threshold, if you keep those grades up, then we will cancel your community college tuition, and this will help people get a leg up. They'll get two inexpensive, well, they'll get two free years done out of a four-year college career. This will get them a better position for a job. Who except misanthropic libertarians could be opposed to a program like that? I guess anyone who has looked at the numbers uh, has a good reason to be against it. So, you know, just a few basic facts. So, first of all, community college graduates make only a very small premium on top of what high, uh, people only in high school degree make. So, it's something around 15%. And that's just looking at the raw numbers, assuming that what you see is what you get. If you think that people who go to community college were somewhat better students than people who don't go to community college, or there would be rather people who, uh, who don't go anywhere beyond high school, then it's probably actually less than a 15% raise. So that's, that, that's just a start, is that you're taking two years out of somebody's life in order to get a fairly modest raise. Um, that, uh, something else that, is, that particularly sticks out for community colleges is that the graduation rate for community college is almost unthinkably low. So it's pretty, it's pretty standard for students who are officially full-time students in community college. Uh, so, uh, so after three years of officially being full-time, it's very standard for them to only have about a 30% completion rate. So you put that together, you have a very, you have a, a well under 50% chance of success, and if you do succeed, the actual gain to the student is, is, is quite modest. Now, let's say, let's say this had been a proposal to expand opportunities to go to four-year schools, because now I, I suppose you've been hearing mm-hmm. a number of news reports about what's been happening in Germany. I guess they have mm-hmm. some type of system now of completely free university education. And that's mm-hmm. probably a policy that you can find in other European countries. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, it, can we extrapolate from your arguments uh, with regard to community college education to four-year colleges? Uh, yes, but community colleges stand out as being a, a uniquely bad investment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, so four-year colleges, again, if you, if you just look at the raw numbers, there is an enormous difference in earnings between college graduates and people who only went to high school. Right now, of course, a reasonable person will say how much of that is really caused by the college. Maybe what you see isn't what you get. Probably the college graduates were better workers all along. That's all reasonable, but at least you start off and see that college graduates earn maybe 80% more than people only went to high school. And then similarly, graduation rates are lower than you would think, but they're not, uh, not nearly as bad as they are for community college. So, I mean, I think, you know, community college you know, is the poster child for, you know, if you just look at the very basic numbers, it just looks like a really bad, a really, really bad idea to encourage it. And essentially, you know, like, you know, do, like with, some, with some obvious exceptions, like you know, Tom Hanks went to community college, but with some obvious exceptions, the, uh, the vast majority of students who go to community college are not, for, are, are not very motivated, and they're not very scholastically inclined. So really, you know, so much of the case for community college comes down to finding a few successful people who went, rather than looking at the vast majority of people who went, uh, who, a vast majority of people who got very little out of it. Now, I guess this particular, in this particular program, the way it works is the money is not being handed to the students. The money is going to the institutions themselves, going mm-hmm. to the administrators. Do you think there are any kind of perverse incentives that are created there? 
Uh, well, let's see, I'd say that in both cases you have pretty perverse incentives because in neither case does the student get the money and then the option to not go to school at all. So I'd say whether you put the money directly in the hands of students at, uh, where you can go and pay for community college or you send it directly to the administration, either way you're giving uh, school and community colleges an incentive to admit students who are very poorly prepared and will probably do very poorly. Uh, so, you know, like, like, you know, so, I mean, just think about, you know, so, like, whether, like, you know, you could either go and send money directly to the grocery store that you shop to give you food stamps, or you could give you food stamps. Both cases, there's, uh, you know, there, there's, there's some perverse incentive, but as to whether it goes directly in the hands of the shopper, or go, or, or they cut out the middleman and send it to, to whatever store you shop at, uh, that's the super matter. Uh, you know, there, there would be a perverse incentive if they sent it to handpicked schools, so that, you know, the schools actually, there's only some schools that are, that not might uh, make, might be very convenient or whatever, but uh, you know, like you know, the main problem is the subsidy, not exactly how the subsidy is administered. But I wonder though if there might be some kind of at least marginal temptation to engage in still further grade inflation, so as to keep more students eligible for the money to keep the money rolling in. Ah, okay. So because of the GPA requirement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there is. Although again, it doesn't really matter whether it's. The money goes to the student. Uh, money goes to the student, or the money goes to the university. Either way, the university doesn't want the students to fall below the threshold and lose their money and then drop out. So that's 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 my point. Is you know, it's, it's the subsidy is the problem. It's not the exact details about who handles the money along the way. As long as, of course, the student can shop or you know, at least shop around with the money, or you know, you can make it even worse by picking ten community colleges and saying they're the only ones that qualify. Then then people have really bad incentives. Uh, tell me about your. Your forthcoming book, I guess you're aiming at 2017. In fact, I think I just read a discussion thread where you were saying that it would probably be ready to go in 2016, but election years are bad for big think books. They get swept aside by mm -hmm. Mike Huckabee's new book. You know, just un yeah, unthinkable, exactly. right? Can't allow that yeah. to happen. So uh, w is there a subtitle? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm actually looking at the file right now. Uh, the subtitle is, A Professional Student Explains Why Education System is a Big Waste of Time and Money. All right, all right. Kit, <laughs> would you mind taking a few minutes to, to walk us through the thesis of the book? Because you're just going to be wetting the appetites of everybody listening. They're not going to say, well, I heard, I heard him talk about it for three minutes. I don't want to read it. I'm dying to read this thing. I want to hear the case you make. Because I know, the, I can imagine what people will say to you, they'll they'll say yes. Look, we know it's a racket in a lot of ways, and you're right that it's a huge investment of time and money. But at the same time, right now, all the employers basically are treating it as a certification process. And if you don't have the certification, even though it's a total waste of time and money in in, in some in some absolute sense, you're going to be locked out of the job market. Even though I understand it makes no sense, but you somehow you still have to participate in it. Uh, sure. I really hope my critics say exactly what you just said because that walks right into my trap. Oh, good. All uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, just at the outset, so there's a very important distinction to make between what I call the selfish return to education and the social return. So the selfish return uh, you know, comes down to is it a good investment for you personally? Is it a good, is it a good use of you know, the years of your life and your tuition money in order to go? Uh, the social return, though, is the question of is it a good deal for society overall? Is it the kind of thing that would be, uh, would be socially beneficial to encourage uh, people, to, uh, people to be getting education? Now, note, now, now, listen to what you were just saying. So, you know, you, you, the story you were saying is that, sure, it's a racket and, and it's not really very, very, very useful, but uh, you have to do it in order to get a job. So essentially, what you're saying is that the so, is that the selfish return is uh, you know is good, even though the even though the social return is not really very good, and actually that's not so far from what I'm saying. So part of what I do in the book is just try to figure out exactly how good of a selfish investment education is, and the punchline there is not too difficult for people to believe, and, it, and it's and it's this: uh, education is a is a good is a good investment, selfishly speaking, for good students, mediocre investment for mediocre students, and a bad investment for bad students. All right, so that's uh, that's the main thing that I have to say, selfishly speaking. But socially speaking, that's where I say something that is quite different from what almost everyone else writing in, in this field says, and that is that even though the self return uh, you know, is pretty good for some people, it is not the kind of thing that it makes sense for society to encourage, precisely because a lot, a lot of what's going on is what you said, that it's certification. And so what's bad about certification? Well, every time you raise the threshold for what counts as the minimum certification you need, you, require, uh, you basically put pressure on people to get one further degree. So, you know, back in 1950 or so, only about 25% of adult Americans had high school diploma. Back then, a high school diploma was what you needed to certify yourself as a serious candidate for a serious job. 
Now, of course, because so many people have high school diplomas, it doesn't really say much, much at all about you, uh, which means now you have to go and get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or even more in order to get those jobs. Uh, so what I say is that education, to a very large extent, is like standing up at a concert uh, in order to see better. You know, you know, so suppose you're sitting in a concert, you want to see better, what do you need to do? Stand up. Uh, does this mean then that the announcer should say, everybody should now stand up in order to see the performers better? And the answer is, of course, no, because everybody stands up, you're blocking each other's views. And I say that to a very large extent, the payoffs to education are like standing up at a concert to see better. It does work at the individual level for people who are scholastically inclined, but it's, it's, but it's extraordinarily wasteful at the social level because the more people have, the more you need in order to get the very same job. What are you going to say to the snide person who you can guarantee is going to say to you, it's easy for Brian Kaplan to tell people that they shouldn't be in the system when he himself went to Berkeley and Princeton, and now he's a professor, and he couldn't have done that if he hadn't been a, a cog in the machine. But it's easy for him in 2017 to tell other kids not to do it. What's the answer? To I, mean, I can anticipate the answer, but I know you're going to get that. Uh, absolutely. I'm again. Once, once again, I, I really, I'm really hoping that they they throw me the softball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, because so, you know, what would I say? So, like, first thing is, look, I'm a whistleblower, and people wouldn't believe me unless I had all this experience with it. Good one. Okay. <laughs> so, I am a whistleblower. I have been in this. I have I have been continuously in school since I was five years old. So I am now in like 38th grade. Uh, if I were someone who dropped out of high school, would anyone take what I had to say seriously? Of course not, because they'd say sour grapes, and how does he really know? He doesn't really understand how the system works. So I have been in the system for as, as long as I can remember virtually, so I think I'm very qualified to talk about how it, re how it really works. And again, that whistleblower role. There are a lot of cases where you need an insider in order to, in order to reveal to outsiders what's really going on. So that's, uh, that, that's a very big part of my answer. Uh, now, now, in, now, in terms of you know, saying whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, that, that, again, it depends upon whether you're talking selfishly or socially. So the heart of my argument is that society is wasting a ton of money on this and that there should be massive cuts in government spending for education at all levels. That is the, that is the main thing I'm going to be pushing, is there's just way too much education, and the reason why there's so much is that government pours over a trillion dollars on education at all levels every single year in the United States. Uh, Selfishly speaking, uh, my view is that for some people, education is a great investment. Uh, you know, who? Well, if, you're a good, if, if you are a good or excellent student, then education pays for you. Uh, so when people ask me for educational advice, I talk to them, you know, I say, look, all right, so I'm giving you advice self you know, for, in your own selfish interest. We're not worrying about what would be the best thing in the world if everybody did it. We're just talking about you. And there my questions are, look, well, how good of a student are you right now? Have you done really well in K-12? Uh, if so, then I would, I would say, selfishly speaking, that uh, a bachelor's degree is probably a very good idea for you. On the other hand, if you're someone who's been struggling in order to get C's in high school, for someone like that, I would say, look, even selfishly speaking, this is just not a very good route for you. You need to go and look into something else because it just gets harder from here, and it's very unlikely you'll succeed. Uh, so in terms of you know, the charge of hypocrisy, I say, look, I don't have a double standard. I have a single standard. And selfishly speaking, the single standard is if you were a very good student through K-12, then continue. Otherwise, not. Uh, and socially speaking, what I say is, you know, really, it's not so much about what you personally should do, but rather, what would, what do you think would be a good idea for government to do? And I say, what's a good idea for government to do is, great, is uh, drastically slash spending on education, which I say, even though it would be terrible for me, but, uh, you know, I'm not, of course, I'm not that worried that people listen to me. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, now, of course, you know, and that this is why you're writing it, that there is almost like a cult surrounding the very idea of education. Oh, yeah. I mean, people have imbibed this. They treat it with a religious fervor, religious devotion. And yet, the people who talk so much about education, and I'm talking about the soccer moms, the average Joe on the street, they themselves don't even really seem to believe it because they talk all about the need to spend more on education. But in their private lives, now that they have the Internet, they can get any classic work of philosophy, literature, anything. <laughs> they're not reading any of it. They're reading some trashy paperback if they're reading anything at all. like they, they have the chance to take courses at MIT for free. Are any of them doing it? No. Yeah, you were a very wise man, Thomas Woods. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, because you know, until the Internet, there was always the story of, well, look, never mind all this economics. Education is good for the soul. <laughs> And you say, yeah, well, but how many people actually are really interested in, in improving their souls? A very small number of people. And so, well, yeah, but for the sake of that small number of people, we need to spend a trillion dollars a year. All right, anyway, well, however silly that is, it's ridiculous now because now anyone who wants to expand their mind can do so for free all the time, endlessly. 
So you know, what really goes on in organized education, it's not people that, people that are learning for the love of learning in order to expand the horizons. It's people who are punching a clock in order to, fulfill, in order to get a credential so they can get a job. That is by far the most common thing that people are doing. Um, and you can even see this just, uh, you know, most college classes don't take attendance. You can just take a look at the attendance in college classes. It's, uh, so it's about 60% on a typical day, maybe 50% on Fridays. Uh, so this is, uh, these are the numbers that we see. Uh, you know, so I think Steven Pinker was complaining about this at Harvard. All these students have worked, have worked to death in order to get into Harvard, and what do they do once they show up? Not go to class. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why aren't they going to class? Because all this, well, the main thing they care about is the grade. And as long as they can get good grades without going to class, the actual content of the course is of very little interest to them. That's the truth. Uh, and by the way, I, I should mention that uh, the, it is very rare that students who are not attending class are attending some other class instead. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> so, right. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, and just sort of the flip side of this is, you know, is, you know even before the Internet, uh, it has been, it's very unusual for colleges to make any effort to stop students who have not paid tuition from attending classes. In fact, usually if you go to, if you're not a student at a university and you go and approach a professor and say, I'm really interested in this subject, may I sit in? The professor gets a shocked look on his face and then gets a little tear in his eyes and says, you want to learn what I have to teach. <laughs> this has never happened before. <laughs> so, you know, like, you know, like it is, it is actually long been, to long, long been very easy for people to get all, the, to get the very best education work for free. Just go and move to Princeton or Cambridge or whatever school you think is best and the blessed on the planet uh, and start attending classes. And the odds that anyone will say no to you, say get out, no free learning for you, is very slim. So why is it that hardly anybody does this? Of course, the answer is at the end of four years of studying as an, uh, studying on your own initiative, there will be no record you ever went there and you're not going to get a job with that. And that's really what, what almost everybody cares about. Now, I the point that you made earlier about when government gets involved and spends all this money, what winds up happening is that it just keeps pushing the bar farther down. Oh, yeah. So you have to get another degree and so on. Now, let's say let's say I said to you that I accept that, and the logic can't be denied. But what do you do? What does the average person who isn't an exceptional student do right now before this transition to Kaplan mm -hmm. Land occurs? What does sure, that sure. person do right now? So, again, just in terms of collecting the numbers, I would say that you, that you should go and take a look at jobs that are well-paid, that don't require a lot of education, and there are a bunch of jobs like this, so you know, plumbers, construction workers of certain kinds, electricians. There are actually a lot of jobs that don't require a lot of education or well-paid, and I'd say, like, you know, go, go and try to break into those, into those fields as an apprentice, and that is going to give you a much better outcome on average than going and continuing to bang your head against an academic wall where you've already got, you know, paid through 12, 13 years of experience showing that you really just don't like school and that you don't have an academic personality. And, you know, there's no shame in that. You know, a lot, you know to, this, to most people, this stuff is super boring. So, and, and of course, you know, and there's the added boredom of realizing you're never going to use this in whatever job you get with it. So again, you know, for, you know, so if my own child were a C student, I would, I would, I would not, I would, I would urge him to not go to a four-year college, urge him to not go to community college. Instead, I would try to help him to go and get an apprenticeship in one of a long list of well-paid jobs that don't require, require a lot of education and just start working and get experience. Uh, and you say, well, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't get me uh, like 200000 a year. Well, like, you know, if you were a C student, you don't have any, any you don't have any likely, outcome, likely ways of getting 200000 a year. I'm just trying to give you the best, you know, to, you know, to tell you to make the most of what you got. And if you know, you're a C student, trying to get a four-year degree is pretty hopeless, really. I, I might add, by the way, of how, how annoyed I am at the accumulation of articles I'm now reading about people who have useless degrees and who are shocked that nobody wants to pay them. And in fact, I just read an article the other day about somebody, she's an adjunct professor of English, and she really thought society was going to pay her to read novels. She said, look at all the stuff I've read. <laughs> yeah, but there's no, like, the, it's wonderful to read novels, but I mean, and also it goes to show they don't even stop to realize that capitalism has made it possible for that even to be conceivable that you could live in a society where your virtue is you've read a lot of novels and it's even conceivable that somebody could pay you a, a salary for that. Yeah, certainly a first for salary. You know, it's, throughout human history, there have been priestly castes who get supported by taxes uh, you know, <laughs> that the government extracts, but not very many of them. And uh, of course, for those, you need to read a few books really well, rather than a ton of different books. But but yeah, but yeah, I mean, your basic point is sound. It's only because there's a, we're a very rich society that government can skim off five percent from what's produced and then hand it out to a bunch of people to uh, pursue their hobbies. 
Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like, you know, I mean, in writing this book, like, you know, so I got a bit of guilt because I realized, well, I am one of these people who is paid very nicely in order to, in order to pursue his hobbies. In a way, this book is, is my atonement. I'm trying to say, look, I'm really benefiting the system, but taxpayers are not benefiting from it. It's a giant ripoff. And let me let me go and open up the sausage factory and show you what's really going on. It's not pretty. And of course, for those people who for, for whom education really does improve the soul and they care about it, there's nothing. There's no rule that says that that has to take place in some ivory tower somewhere. You can read these yeah. books anytime you want to. At yeah, home. you can read them anytime, and you can also attend the classes for free. You, you can attend the classes for free. That. You can find online book clubs. I mean, you have all yeah, kinds yeah, of online opportunities. Online discussions, yeah, and, and listen. I mean, honestly, so out of all, you know, so I know a ton of professors. There's not a single one of them who actually got good by sitting in classes and listening to what we told in class. The, the only way you actually really expand your soul and, and, and your horizons is by becoming an autodidact and reading voraciously on your own. Yeah, and I'll, t- I'll tell and you, you know, yeah, well, when I was at Harvard, of course, they have the biggest private library in the world. And <laughs> what was nice was that the, this is going. <laughs> well, the books that the books that you and I would want to read, nobody else wants to read. So I never, I never had to wait for a book. I, I would never go, and that book was checked out. I never. <laughs> it was no, you know, reading critics of the New Deal from the 1930s. They were always on the shelf. But I mean, that that was really where a Co- lot covered, of covered in dust. Yeah, covered that's in right. dust, covered no in doubt. dust. You're yeah. darn right. And that's how. And and by the way, when they were moving back, this back this is back when having a barcode system was super high tech. All books I wanted, they didn't even have barcodes on them yet. They would have to manually put them on as I brought them to the desk. So I thought, well, I'm performing a service. I'm getting all these books barcoded for them. But that was where I got a lot of my education. Now, now, sure, at a place like that, you really do get a lot of top-notch instruction, and you do have a decent number of motivated people. And I did learn some stuff in the classroom, but I became agonizingly yeah. aware of how much stuff I was never going to learn. Right. But if, 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 you only, if you only learn. knew what you learned in the classroom, what would you know? That's yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's yeah, what, what a boring drone you'd be. I mean, you'd just be a good tape recorder. I mean, the world doesn't yeah. need more of those. All right, Brian, is there anything while we wait for your book to come out, is there anything I can link to to, to whet people's appetites about your thesis? Uh, sure. So uh, one of my most liked blog posts ever is called The Magic of Education. All right. And uh, that's you know, maybe 800 words that spells out my whole story. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, well, it interweaves my life story with everything I'm going to say in the book. So I think that uh, you know, people really like the post. So that's, that's what I recommend to people. All right. I'm going to put that on the show notes page for this episode. This is episode number 320. So it's tomwoods.com slash 320. And there we'll also link to your personal website, which is bkaplan.com. That's B and then Kaplan with a C. Uh, I appreciate your time, Brian. You can fit two hours worth of material in 25 minutes, and that that's a fantastic quality for a podcast guest. Thanks so much for your time. I do my best. Thanks a lot, Tom. All right, everybody, make sure you subscribe to the show because you are getting a dose of Liberty Education Monday through Friday. You can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher over at Tom Woods. Dot com. Remember, the show notes page for this episode is tomwoods.com slash 320. By the way, interesting thing on my Facebook page the other day, somebody posted, um, facebook.com slash Thomas E. Woods is my, the page that I actually post on, and somebody posted that she'd been looking for a good turkey recipe, and so she stumbled upon the show, because you'll recall I had my wife on the show, I guess back in late 2013, because my wife has never prepared a bad turkey, ever. She has some genius for it. So I had her on to talk about it, and then the conversation degenerated in, into what we talked about on our first date, and she was trying to say that I talked about economics on our first date, and I absolutely deny this <laughs> to this day, but anyway, she has a pretty good memory, and I don't, so who knows. But anyway, this person said, I was stopping by for a turkey recipe, and then I found that I really liked your content. So I thought, hey, you know, however, it, you know, whatever works, right? Whatever gets people over here. So check us out at TomWoods.com. Subscribe to the show there. Thaddeus Russell tomorrow. Man, you are going to enjoy hearing from this guy. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.